So, I may have mentioned recently that I've been rereading Sansa's chapters from A Song of Ice and Fire with the aim to make an in-depth psychological analysis about her, but one of the things I couldn't help thinking as I reread them is just how badly the show Game of Thrones understood Sansa's character. Shock of all shocks, you know, the show infamous for ruining almost every character arc also ruined Sansa's. Um, the problem here is that a, I'm not entirely sure how well they understood her even from the beginning, and B, I think some of the errors in her characterization are so damaging to the overall themes and purpose of the story that I think it's really worth talking about. And there is one specific scene I have in mind that particularly bothers me a lot. Um, it's probably not the one you're thinking of, I don't know, but in the build up to that scene we're going to discuss a few other real damaging aspects first, and I don't know, hopefully we'll learn something, let's just start. By the way, apologies if there's a lot of background noise this video, we currently have all three of the rabbits here, we're bonding them, so there's a little bit of uh, kind of scuffles and rivalry going on between them at the moment. But yeah, the first one is the obvious one, which is Sansa's wedding night with Ramsay. It's a horrible, mostly unnecessary scene of SA for which the show received a lot of complaints. I think most of the direct stuff to say about this scene has already been said, however I think it's also a symptom of a wider issue permeating the show's depiction of Sansa from the very beginning. That problem uh, essentially is having two writers who deliberately wanted to play up both the sex and the violence as part of the show's appeal, combined with a character who, on the surface, doesn't have a huge amount to do. Much of Sansa's character arc has her trapped as a pawn within other people's schemes and power, particularly so in King's Landing. Um, I think to say she has nothing to do is a little unfair, especially so in the books, but the books have the advantage of getting to detail her inner thoughts and her character progression on a more internal level, whereas the show can't easily do that. And when on the surface she doesn't get much agency, that makes it difficult for them to know what to do with her. Sansa's chapters in the books, I guess you can say, are a psychological exploration of uh, concepts of good and evil via a child's struggle to come to terms with them, plus a pretty unrelenting look at how a girl can not only be exploited by political schemes, but also paralysed by other people's desires and expectations upon her as a woman. I don't know, look, there's a hell of a lot in her chapters that gets to the hearts of what The Song of Ice and Fire is about. This is speculation, I know, um, but I feel like lacking the subtlety to express a lot of that in Sansa's story then leaves them with a character who isn't really doing anything at all in the show, so they tried to make up for this absence of story by playing up the horrors she suffered as much as possible. Make that the entertainment rather than trying to subtly weave in elements that go deeper into the psychology. Now I'm saying this all in a very convoluted way, I think what I'm basically trying to say is a lot of Sansa's scenes relegate her to just being the victim in a slightly gratuitous way. Perhaps the prime example from the King's Landing section of the story is the scene with the mob that attempts S.A. until the Hound appears in the nick of time. I think there's a line between expressing this kind of horror for the sake of important theme and playing it up for mere entertainment. And when you get too lost in that entertainment, suddenly Sansa isn't a human exploration of the kind of of struggles a girl might face in this world and is instead just I don't know if objectifying is the word, but it doesn't feel as empathetic and human a portrayal of Sansa. Does that not make sense? I don't think I'm talking nonsense there. It's not too egregious in the early examples of this, um, however, as the show keeps going on and they haven't really done enough of the character work with Sansa beyond putting her in awful situations, they've not really set up much progression, which I think then leaves them with the question of what to actually do with her her following King's Landing, because in the book Sansa escapes to the Eyrie with Littlefinger's help where she begins to start processing a little of her trauma as well as having to tread a thin line between learning from Littlefinger's teachings whilst also attempting to keep him at a distance. I think the stage is set there in a really interesting way for Sansa to start developing politically in the next book.
books, uh, among other things. Stuff I'll talk about properly in a character analysis video on her in the future. But in the show, she escapes to the Aerie. It faintly appears to build to something, but again, with little actual exploration of the character. Making it feel a bit like a dead end, to which they have no solution to, other than to put her back into another horrible situation that again removes her agency, making her an object within her own character arc. So Littlefinger sends her to the Dreadfort for some unfathomable reason, and Sansa's arc from the early seasons largely just repeats again, only this time they have to make it more horrific, more dramatic. Plus there's not really any wider context to explore this time, like the politics of King's Landing, or Sansa's interactions with the Hound, or Tyrion, or slowly adapting her view of what a knight is, or any of that. There's none of that in the Dreadfort, it's just her and Ramsay and a bit of Theon. Um, and the end result is something not just tasteless and pointless, but also with no interest in who Sansa actually is as a person. So yeah, Maybe I've been quite harsh there for the sake of keeping this concise, um, but I do feel like they never fully understood or at least executed her arc in the early series, for which this eventual decline kind of feels inevitable when you look at it all. And even if it is a bit harsh for me, it does lead into another troubling point. But you know what I've got to do first, you know this is coming. My father was a traitor. My mother and brother were traitors too. I am loyal to my beloved. World Anvil. Of course you are. Yes, World Anvil are still sponsoring me. This is a company I genuinely love. I'm going to keep promoting and supporting them as long as I physically can. <laughs> and all of you are going to listen intently. Um, World Anvil is an online tool for world building, character creation, story planning and writing, campaign building and playing lots of different games. A lot of useful stuff. I use it for my novel with the sprawling mess all of my world building turned into and even just like I was keen on my fictional talent having a strong sense of community so there was pages after page of who lives where, what do they think of their neighbours, where do they work, what are their opinions on local gossip, I don't know, a very big sprawling mess that World Anvil can really help to organise with hyperlinks, different categories, timelines, you can even completely build out of your own designed calendars. Again with hyperlinks attached to other articles and a map to link the different timeline events to if you fancy that. When there is so much detail it is hard to remember it all and having something like this to just quickly glance at and see what happens where and when becomes so damn handy. And there are other tools as well, I've not used all of them yet myself but all the ones I have used are pretty straightforward. They do have lots of tutorials for how to use everything but I've never needed to watch them, I've just figured it out myself pretty easily. There is a link in the description and as a pinned comment there is the code TREE which entitles you to 40% off any of their yearly subscriptions. And if you want to try it out first, they have a free version. Test that out for as long as you like first. Get familiar with World Anvil, you know. If you're interested, click the link. World Anvil. Okay, I'm actually going to chuck in this bonus short point first. The show largely removes the character of Jane Paul from the story. Sansa's best friend, the daughter of Ned Stark's steward who travels with Sansa to King's Landing, largely removing her from the story means we don't really get many examples in the show of Sansa actually getting on well with people. Nor of Sansa actually being a child. She's supposed to be 11 at the start of the books, and we lose a lot of the reminders in the show that she is basically a sweet, slightly naive girl who gets exploited for her vulnerabilities. I think we are all aware there are a lot of people who find Sansa really annoying as a character, which is a shame, um, and I'd certainly argue against that, however it is true to say we never really see much of the positive, fun, heartwarming examples of Sansa as a child. We tend to only really either see her used as a kind of haughty foil to Arya, or the examples of her getting easily manipulated or naively supporting Joffrey or whatever other actions we can understand a child doing but beyond understanding don't really endear people to her if they are already a bit dismissive of Sansa. Which yeah, not just in terms of likeability but also 
story um, again means we don't get to see Sansa do much other than be the victim of gratuitous scenes. So in a way, I guess by removing Jane Paul, David and Dan bludgeons two birds with one horrible stone. A, it removes scenes where we get the important childlike sides of Sansa, and B, it means Sansa ends up in the Dreadfort with Ramsay instead of, in the books, Jane Paul being the one who goes there. Sansa is still very much in the veil with little finger, learning things, developing rather than repeating her arc. I understand why Jane Paul would seem like a character worth trimming out of the story, but I think her absence isn't isn't directly damaging, but indirectly I think it has a massive effect on the story, and Sansa in particular. It's kind of a shame when you think about it all. Sansa is a character whose story is partly supposed to explore the ways women can be treated like objects in the world of Westeros, and then the show ends up just treating her like one itself. Until something that does happen a little later, we're coming to that, but I want to make this other point first. So you could potentially argue this is the worst one, it's Sansa's relationship with Tyrion, which is very different to the books. In the books, neither of them want to be married, but recognise that they're kind of forced to. Sansa recognises that Tyrion is capable of kindness, and she appreciates how he has treated her in the past. However, she is still a traumatised child, stuck in a world where it feels far too unsafe for her to possibly be herself. Especially around the Lannisters, when she's constantly terrified about being tricked into revealing herself as a traitor. Plus, Tyrion wants her in the books, unquestionably. He recognises and states that she is a child, and he seems afraid at the fact he would want a child, but he still does. He makes her undress. He is described as groping at her. There was hunger in his green eye, it seems to her, and fury in the black. Sansa did not know which scared her more. Tyrion is not a heroic, good character in the books, and so Sansa never trusts him, is never at all open with him, keeps herself very much trapped behind her armour, which has been largely an important factor in her survival in King's Landing. No amount of Tyrion's cheery quips or pleasantries are able to undo that visceral fear and danger Sansa is in, that important survival instinct of hers. And yet we see Tyrion gradually taking her distance and lack of openness as a personal rejection, and resenting her for that, as though it is a right that she should fall into his arms simply because he isn't as cruel to her as other Lannisters. Okay, that might be slightly unfair um, and underplaying the complexities there, but even so, I think the show takes that general idea and instead basically whitewashes Tyrion into a kind man that she comes to very much like, even if not exactly love. Suddenly King's Landing is all quite fun, and Sansa has an ally in this very sympathetic character. Why is it a problem? Um, well it just feels so much like strange wish fulfilment, like just because you show a few acts of kindness to someone, you somehow deserve their love or their openness. I don't want to be too critical because the show isn't explicitly making them a romance, they're not. Tyrion wants Shay, not Sansa in the show, so it's not direct, but there are still faint feelings. And all of it feels framed from Tyrion's perspective and his desires rather than what Sansa is going through. Kindness is not an exchange that entitles you to love. When you view it like an exchange, then it's not kindness. That was much of what Sansa's arc explored in the early books. You know, um, Sedontus provides a plan to help Sansa escape, they then name each other after characters Florian and John Keel from the stories, and Sedontus keeps attempting to kiss her, this kind of this expectation placed upon her that because Sedontus is good enough to try and rescue her, he is therefore entitled to her love, or that they're supposed to be romantic figures. Littlefinger is pretty much doing the exact same thing in his own way. And then Tyrion, being mostly respectful and pleasant on the surface, only to become resentful that she never grows close to him as a result of that respect. There is that uncomfortable expectation that a girl is supposed to fall in love with her rescuers, or is supposed to accept their advances upon her in exchange for being rescued, and so rather than criticising that perspective and exploring the problems with that, changing Tyrion and Sansa's relationship I think completely undermines all of that stuff and kind of unintentionally enforces that idea that she's supposed to be 
grateful towards him. Even if it isn't directly romance, there are faint feelings, I think, of romance, and this, it certainly plays on the trope of Beauty and the Beast there in certain ways. Um, also, let's remember Sansa is a child in all of this. Even in the show where she's made older, she's still only 14. I just... I just need to state that. Enough of that though, let's finally get to what I think is the biggest, most damaging factor, the real thing I wanted to talk about. Alright, so this is Season 8 territory now. It almost feels unfair to rag on Season 8 because it's so easy to. But I do find this singular moment so abhorrent that it's probably the thing I dislike most about the entire show. And don't get me wrong either, I love the show. I can very happily talk about the many things it got right, as I have been doing in these videos. But if there was ever a moment that could have broken my overall enjoyment for Game of Thrones, it would definitely have been this moment. In season 8, Sansa reunites with Sandor Clegane, who tells her that if she had left King's Landing with him, she'd never have suffered Littlefinger or Ramsay or any of it. To which Sansa says, Without Littlefinger and Ramsay and the rest, I would have stayed a little bird all my life. <sighs> I, I just... It always unsettles me when stories glorify trauma and abuse like it's some important rite of passage for growing up, you know? It, it, like, without the horrendous suffering Sansa was put through, she'd be someone we're supposed to view as either pathetic or innocent in a totally pure sort of way, and that is just so worrying. No, Sansa would not have been a little bird all her life. She was a child at the time who was in spite of everything, growing up. Her arc, if portrayed well, would have shown her gradually growing up. Instead of being a total object for suffering until suddenly doing a 180 and turning into a girl boss out of nowhere with the message that abuse makes people stronger? It's so bizarre. Sansa is a very complicated person who is absolutely not flawless, however a lot of her heroism is that she can still hold on to her humanity despite what she's put through. That she can grow in spite of it, not because of it. Um, I hope I'm not expressing this badly because it's not to say people are doomed by trauma, that nothing good can ever possibly come out of it because no, it happens. With time it is possible to start to process some of it and to take away some positive growth from some of that, and that is absolutely a heroic thing to manage to do. But that doesn't make trauma good, and it doesn't mean all of it leads to something really positive, or that it's guaranteed to do that, or that it would magically erase all of the pain. But my criticism really is, I suppose, both these points. The really uncomfortable framing of all of these awful, sometimes gratuitous scenes that we've seen throughout the show, to now frame that as something that was apparent apparently good for Sansa, that she needed to happen. As viewers of a show meant for entertainment, to give it that framing is worrying. Um, and at the same time, the outright framing of the child Sansa used to be as something pathetic now, this weak little bird. Is there a very faint, awful suggestion that the young Sansa deserves this trauma as punishment for not growing up sooner. I really hope that's not the message. Alright, let me, let me be kind of fair, you know, in, in a way it could be interesting for Sansa to look on her younger self like that, because it's certainly possible, it's the way Cersei and many others looked on the younger Sansa. It's in fact arguably how Cersei deals with her own trauma, to frame similar girls whose experiences a younger Cersei could have related to, to to frame them as pathetic and weak and dismally innocent in her eyes. But that isn't what the show's doing with Sansa here, this isn't an exploration of that kind of mindset, this is supposed to be some positive, concluding, wholesome ending to her arc. And I really don't like it. Um, so yeah, the more I look at the show, the more I wonder if David and Dan were inevitably going to lead Sansa here, if they never understood her well enough to see beyond the exact social trappings that Sansa's story is meant to explore. I'm a therapist, so obviously this kind of message unsettles me. I think stories have a wonderful power to help you understand people beyond yourself, to understand experiences you haven't lived. That's what a lot of this channel's been about, I guess, um, and maybe not always the understanding 
understanding itself that isn't the crucial bit exactly so much as to make you curious and interested, to make you empathetic to try and understand people beyond your world view. Good writing and characterization can do that wonderfully, but when characterization goes wrong, such as here in my opinion, you end up less curious about the experiences of Sansa or of people who might relate to her, and instead become more dismissive and judgmental and less empathetic. Naturally, that kind of thing bothers me. And on the point of judgement, there's no one judgement we can make about Game of Thrones to deem it either good or bad. I think it's both those things in a lot of different confusing aspects. Not even just in a season 1 to 4 good, season 5 to 8 bad kind of way. It's just all over the place. So yeah, as much as I am likely to continue analysing what worked, what I enjoyed, celebrating what we can take away, I don't think that should ever make us blind to aspects that failed like this. Sansa Stark could have arguably been the beating heart of the entire story, except she wasn't. That's what I think, anyway. Uh, what do you think? What did I miss, or get wrong, or simplify too much? Like the video if you like it. Are you looking forward to a character analysis of Sansa? Subscribe if you want more stuff, or maybe even support me on Patreon, but otherwise, hopefully see you next time. And as ever, a special thank you goes to Luke Kaur, Tree Tree Caber, Michael Gallagher, Flying Spider, Kellyanne Davidson, Billy Lee Myers Jr., Samara Salsi, Joshua C. Follier, Chad Bramhall, and Michael Hart. Thank you.